So good evening and welcome to the next in our series of uh, webinars aimed at supporting uh, dental professional colleagues across the four nations in terms of their journey through this unprecedented period. I'm joined this evening by Professor Fraser MacDonald from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, Professor Albert Long from the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland, Dr. Jimmy Boyle from the Royal College of Surgeons, Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, and by Janine Brooks from the Faculty of General Dental Practice myself, Michael Scudio, from the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Um, the topic this evening is about health and well-being, something I think that's not only dear to our hearts, but something that's really important for all practitioners and patients and staff. And I, I think as an opening point, it might be helpful to hear from Janine, who's obviously both a coach and a mentor, of her experiences over the last two to three months in terms of people reaching out for support. So, Janine, over to you, I think. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yes, it's been a it's been an interesting period, and I think we have seen um, a number of individuals who have been quite anxious and worried uh, about their situation in dental practice over the time, um, particularly about their businesses and what's going to happen about keeping those businesses afloat. But there haven't been the numbers of people seeking formal support. Um, that we might have expected. So, for example, the Dentist Health Support Trust that supports um, dental professionals with mental health, alcohol, substance abuse problems, um, the Practitioner Health Programme that, again, supports dentists that have got health problems. Both of those have seen a reduction of almost 30% in their referrals over the period, which, which sounds counterintuitive uh, when we're going through a period of, of such huge change and unrest and it'll be interesting to see why that is and what happens to people's um, health as they get back into practice and begin to find that their the new normal is completely different and we're having to work in a completely different way and not only are we worried about patients but we're worried about ourselves we're worried about our staff so it may be that at the moment we're seeing a reduction in people seeking formal support perhaps they're seeking a lot more informal support we've seen a lot more whatsapp groups people networking remotely, chatting with colleagues, perhaps in a way that they never did before. So it may be that we, we, we think things are okay at the moment, but I suspect that's just bubbling under and we're going to start to see problems as people get back into work. Okay, so interesting, Jimmy, you, you obviously spend time doing postgraduate education and I wondered if how some of the trainees and, and individuals be at, at um, foundation training, dental core training, or the equivalent within Scotland and so on to specialist trainees, how they've been finding the, the period? Yeah, I, there, there is a, a, a significant anxiety out there, Michael. Um, I think on a number of levels, I, I think first of all, there, there are concerns around work opportunities and what might be coming for them in the future. Uh, our cohort of trainees are about to finish this summer and are looking at associateship and will associateships even be there and uh, they don't know and um, the other aspect to this is that the people we have currently have in training have had a fairly significant gap in clinical experience within the training period so one of the other difficulties they have is that they are going to go into an associateship with expectations around clinical ability which i don't know if you ever took a six month gap from accessing a molar endo but it's a long time not to do these things um there's a lot of anxiety around that but there's also a, quite a considerable anxiety with the cohort who we expect to come in at the end of this summer because they also had a significant gap at the end of their undergraduate period and they're going to come into a training post which is new and intimidating at the best of times but of course more so when, when you've had a longer clinical experience gap than you would have liked yeah, I, for interest, I did have quite a long gap because for a while I did medical undergraduate training and I had about two years out from doing any dentistry. I'd done some maxillofacial surgery, but what I remember was being actually really happy to take out teeth, but really apprehensive about picking up an air turbine again or even a slow hand piece. Um, so if you wanted your tooth out, it was fine. If you needed a filling, I was going to book you a month away while I got my confidence back. And that was as someone who was a fairly experienced practitioner, not someone going in as a new graduate with a, a, a more limited experience. So 
Um, I, I also wonder whether some of, you know, I, I still practice and I'm, I'd be interested to see how, how I find it when I go back after what has been my longest gap, three months away from clinical practice. Uh, and I, uh, there was a phrase used in, in one of the medical rural colleges that said, it's okay not to be okay. And I think it's really important to realize that being apprehensive, if you're not apprehensive, there's almost a, that's probably a problem because I, I certainly have some apprehension about it and I suspect most of the panel do. Um, moving on with trainers, Fraser, you might like to comment what we've been trying to do in the colleges to try and mitigate some of that stress for trainees particularly. Well, I know particularly all the training units are trying to do as much online training as possible. I mean, it's a steep learning curve for all the educators to pick up all these new skill sets. And clearly, I mean, our generation has not been as uh, uh, familiar with social media or all the electronic communication devices. And anybody that's been on any uh, conference with me will know that they don't always work very well. But it is frustrating with all this information coming into people that aren't used to it. Whereas the younger generation and their um, WhatsApp groups and all these types of connections have lots of information coming in. But the problem at the moment is everybody's got so much information in, you're worried you're missing the important aspect of it. And there is so much coming through that says, frankly, so little. And it's knowing which is the most important to apply directly to your practice and to your actually clinical work. So I think one of the big issues is being in isolation, people don't know if they're looking at the right documents. And certainly as the Royal Colleges, we're trying to point everybody to the right documents. Um, but we don't want to give false hope because as we all know, there's potential of second spikes, third spikes, whatever is going to occur in the future. Um, but it is important that everybody realises they can ask somebody. And if anything, it's taught people the skills to ask. And there's no such thing as a silly question. It's important that people clear in their mind what are the important things for their own individual clinical training circumstances. And Albert, you obviously work in a higher educational institution. How have you been faring with all your trainees and postgraduate students? Well, I think that when the lockdown came, and we came in sort of a semi-surprise, a few were not surprised, but uh, when the non-face-to-face -face teaching became the only mode of teaching, there was quite a bit of adjustments as far as the teachers are concerned, as far as the students were concerned. And a lot of the students then complained, quite rightly, to say that, well, I didn't sign up for this sort of training. I signed up for clinical, clinical skills, lectures, seminars, not just one or two, but obviously there is nothing anybody can do about it. And obviously it took a while for everybody to get used to the fact that if you are to deliver any meaningful education in this particular period, is face-to-face, -face. no, not on anymore, it's not face-to-face, -face. it's either that or nothing. As far as the training is concerned, training is concerned there, that if they are in the sort of the final year of training, they could have been very, very lucky that the term ends in June and lockdown came in March, most of the work that needs to be done have been done. But not everybody was as lucky. The problem then comes along with what about if you are in your penultimate year, you really have got it stuck both ways because it was a stop, your case is not building up, you're not getting anything more, you don't know what's going to go next, and you're looking for progression where there may not be a space here for progression at that stage. And so it is a both a learning curve for the teachers, learning curve for the students, and also learning curve for the practitioners where we take, a lot of practitioners come in to learn part-time. When the case has dried up, when the income all of a sudden dried up, they say, well, we can't afford to pay the fees anymore. What's going to happen? Well, we can't. We don't know what's going to happen. And also, what we are currently seeing now is that with the non-face-to-face -face teaching being delivered to some extent, and some are better than some are others, a lot of colleagues are yearning to go back to work because Dentistry is very much a delivery profession. Prior practical dentistry, 95% of dentistry in the UK and Ireland are in the primary care sector. They want to go back. Will there be a practice firm to go back? Don't know all the time. What environment that will be? Don't know. What financial arrangement there may be? 
don't know again. Um, so these are the sort of anxiety combination of which is what we find and as college just as well we find that this is a combination of the things that we see and there's no perfect solutions to that altogether i say and so can, I can, I in, can i come in on that yeah please do just in relation to the point you made about it's okay not to be okay and 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 really something janine said about dentists not routinely seeking help or, or seeking help less than they, they did previously um i think there's an inherent problem here in, ge in dentists generally but in general dental practitioners in particular that we don't recognize when we're not fit for work and I, i'm speaking as the guy who broke his ankle on a saturday worked on the monday morning and then went to get a plaster cast in the monday afternoon um, we, we we don't recognise illness in ourselves when it's staring us in the face, when it's when it's stress or when there's a, a, a mental health component to this. I have a real concern that we could have dentists who are continuing to work. Uh, it's kind of patently obvious to everyone else that they are not in a good place and really should not be seeing patients. But in the in the trot to the surgeries, and it just highlights what Albert was saying about there is this work ethic when you go to work no matter what. And I think from that perspective, it's maybe very important that that we're all aware of the signs in others. You know, the indicators that someone is perhaps suffering stress. I'm, I'm sure Julie is going to come back on this, but but how do we recognise that in others? What are the telltale signs that someone else might not be coping? And then we sign people, signpost people to the, the right sort of resources to help them. Yeah. So Janine, I, Jimmy makes a really good point. How, would you like to follow up on that? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a that's an excellent point, Jimmy. And I think it has always been there. You're absolutely right. Um, that very often the person who is most unwell is the one who's least likely to recognise it. Certainly in the beginning, um, and it's colleagues around them that are most likely to see changes in them. Um, and those sort of changes are. Uh, people's ten temperament, so they're going to lose their temper more quickly, um, they're not coping in the same way that they did, they're late to work, um, they're, they're not um, communicating with colleagues, so they're not taking part in conversations within the, um, within the surgery, within the practice. Um, they, they're not sort of, if you like, looking after themselves in the same way, they're not eating um, properly they're not sleeping very well uh, and so they, they tend to pick up on these because the one thing about practice is that the team are very close um, and I don't just mean physically close they know each other generally very well so it's the team that are more likely to pick up on these changes than actually even people at home because you're with your team you will be with your team more frequently than people at home and I think it's it's about looking out for each other and being able to say to each other you know look i don't think you're you're too good at the moment i don't think things are right you know and how do we seek that help and and team members can seek help themselves by ringing up you know and and checking with php with dentist health support trust you know look, look this has happened what do you think is this is this a problem do we need to try and help this colleague um because the, the, the problem, though, that we do have is that, that some people do mask the, the emotional issues that they've got actually really very well. Um, and so some of that, I think, is that we, we may need to try to institute far more, far more talking type things, you know, networking and getting people to talk. And, and actually, one of the things that this has done is that people are remotely networking more than they probably ever did so that could be a tiny silver lining that we move forward that people are talking to each other to colleagues much much more than they did before i think, I think you're absolutely right Jenny. And, and and i think that there's a, um, a real importance to to recognizing the current covid situation because a lot of people i think consider them stressed at the moment but don't worry when COVID-19 is all finished, it'll go away. So you put the thing off, you put the thing off, you put the thing off, and then in six months time, we'll find that the new normal appears, whatever that's going to be. And whatever it is, it will not be non-stressful. <laughs> so that they find themselves six months into a problem that they could have addressed very early on. Fraser, I think you wanted to come in. Yeah, I think 
the other issue we've got with our profession, and it's not a criticism, it's just the way we've all been designed. If we are not working, we are not generating money to pay the mortgage, to pay for the school fees. And yet we hear all these stories of these services behind us that are still expecting to be supported financially. And yet here we are. I know the NHS is supporting a little bit. There's no doubt, probably a bit more than that. But there are lots there whose businesses you can see disappearing. And some of the practices have been built up over many years painstakingly. By, and so they've got not only the stress of are they going to be ill, but how are they going to cope financially? I do notice there are some very intermittent reports from many of the financial houses that do offer support, how to talk through your problems of debt, how to make sure you're servicing things properly. Because, I mean, everybody has this view that dentists are in a straightforward, will generate money situation, but this is not generating money for anybody. It is causing major problems. And particularly when you hear stories of there are not funds to support PPE in certain parts of the country, it, it is a big issue. So the self-employed have got that stress on top of everything else. And I do think, um, the, in fairness to a lot of the banks, they have stepped up to the mark and offered, as you say, this online support to talk to somebody, to go through problems and just try and resolve them in an objective way. So I think on that point, Fraser, I think it's really interesting that you can, as a small business, go for an up to £50,000 interest-free loan. It's interest-free for the first year. I know a number of dental practitioners who've actually ex actioned that to take £50,000 from the government, and it's interest-free for a year. And then I think the interest rate going on from that, someone who's done it was telling me just the other day that it was about £105 a month in interest. And for him, that had been an enormous weight off his mind to think that he had a £50,000 cushion for the next year. Jimmy, you wanted to come in on that. No, I was just I was just going to mention that, um, yes, people are running into financial problems in, in reassuring to hear that there are agencies out there who will support you. But the problem that we have as dentists is that there are all these stories about dentists make huge amounts of money, and I'm sure there are a few who do, but most of us don't. And the problem is that because of the reputation we have, financial instability or financial failure is deemed as personal failure on the part of the practitioner. And because of that, we don't talk about it until we are so deep in the hole it's almost impossible to dig our way out and and that's another challenge and i wonder whether i mean janine was talking about the 30 30 percent drop in people seeking help already during this period it almost mirrors the medical drop off in urgent cases presenting where people have felt that they didn't want to trouble the nhs or other people at a time when they were stretched i just wonder whether that's fed into that drop off as well in terms of just a reluctance to, to add to the burden of all these other organisations. Um, if we turn our attention then, I, I mean, I think there are a number of things. We've talked about staff, we've talked about trainees. We haven't talked about patients and actually having to deal with patients who may themselves for various reasons be stressed. I mean, Janine, what, how would you see that for how that might manifest for practitioners as they go back and, and, and look to their patients to return? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Michael, because um, we've always dealt with um, nervous, anxious, special patients um, and they can be very draining on your own um, particular um, psyche when you're dealing with patients like that. And colleagues that work in the community and the hospital um, know about how difficult that can be. We're going to be finding that with our general practitioner colleagues who perhaps previously a fairly decent proportion of patients were, um, weren't particularly anxious or nervous um, about their dentistry and they are going to become nervous and anxious. They're going to be asking a lot more questions. They're going to be wanting to know about what people are wearing and how often do they clean the surgery and they're going to ask all sorts of questions, I suspect. Um, and those, if you like, are the savvy patients. And then there'll be patients who, who already were nervous and a little bit worried, but they're going to be terrified by all the, the new things like that. They can't wait in the waiting room perhaps any more than they used to. They, they've got to have telephone contact with the dentist. They're going to ask them questions about 
temperature and all the other things and then they come in and they find screens up in front of the receptionist that wasn't there before um, and people wearing masks that are quite different to the masks they might have worn before um, so I think I think patients are going to because they see that they may be worried that they're uh, they may get an infection that actually this is protecting them against but they see it and they think oh well you're only doing that because i'm likely to get infected by even walking through this door um so i think i think having to deal with nervous and worried patients uh is going to increase um and that i think needs training for receptionists and dental nurses as well as the dentists and the hygienists and the therapists about how you talk to people in simple language without alarming them more than you need to. I mean, the other thing, interestingly, there's this discussion now about mouth rinses. Um, and I'm just curious how that's going to go about, because on the one hand, they're saying there isn't evidence. On the other hand, they're saying that the saliva load of viruses is, is high. Um, how you put that over to a patient, I think, is also going to be a, a tricky conversation to have. Yeah, and I think you're right. We'll have to see how the evidence plays out at the moment. As you say, the evidence suggests that there isn't a huge benefit, but there are others looking actively at the moment. And I think it, one of the challenges for the profession going forward will be, as Fraser said, keeping up to date and seeing where you are. Jimmy, you wanted to come in there, I think. So. No, I was just going to make a point about the anxious patient and, and the level of anxiety that might change as we come out of COVID-19. We could, we could be looking at big numbers of anxious patients who have had to see a dentist other than their normal dentist. And, and I'm not suggesting that the normal dentist is wonderful, but familiarity is, is, is worth a lot in these situations. And just having to see someone else is a stressful event in itself. But the other thing as we come out of the, the, the COVID-19, we're back into generating aerosols and things like that, particularly for the anxious patient, a small filling, which has been left for six months, is now a big filling. A big filling, which has been left for six months, is now possibly endodontics. And endodontics, which has been left for six months, is now possibly extraction. And, and for the anxious patient, it, it's just racking up the complexity of what they have to go through in an event which they find stressful before you even start. And certainly, I think we'll see variation around the country because quite a lot of patients that, that I've talked to, they've been, we've obviously got a big group of people who've been shielding themselves, who will be still apprehensive about travelling. And, and one of the experiences in London and some of the other big cities is patients' apprehension is not about the dental setting. It's merely getting to the dental setting because they're going to have to use public transport. So I don't know if anyone, perhaps, Jimmy, if you have some thoughts on that, do you think that's yeah. going to be a big challenge? Jimmy. Um, yeah. Oh, you're, just, you're coming here before. Sorry, Chris. Uh, uh, Michael, I was, I was just going to say that as far as the patient's dentist relationship is concerned, it looks like that the communication will be absolutely crucial. The first experience of patient coming into something that is in the new normal, when the dentist comes to new normal, everybody will be nervous about it. So it's very important that for the dentist to be able to explain to the patients what they are doing aims and objectives and what they are so try to calm the fear because if the perception of the patient is that i don't really want to be here i know it's here is very very bad for me it's in a very bad wrong footing in the first place and the dentist will get very nervous as well oh, this patient is not going to turn up what am i going to do i can't really do this is aerosol generating the patient is not cooperating and am i going to give any mouthwash or not it doesn't actually work so it compounds problems onto problems itself, which has to be solved. Obviously, the dentist will need to look for professional help, like Janine and others, very important on that. But as far as the patient is concerned, the patients also need to be assured that dentists, for dentists, we are actually very good at infection prevention and control. We dealt with the SARS, we dealt with MARS, uh, when we dealt with dealing with COVID in a similar manner with a very different success, maybe. At the end of the day there, it is going to go, it is going to pass, and we're trying to minimize the infectivity, but we are hopefully going to do it in a very, very calm, cool manner, at, if at all possible. Jim, I was going to say, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, yeah, it's, I, I think we shouldn't underestimate the anxieties of patients. Um, if patients are anything like me, they're watching three times as much news as they ever did before. And, 
and, and they are believing everything that, that they hear. And travel to your dental practice, does that involve you sitting in your car outside in the car park until you get a text to say you can come in? What's going to happen when you do get in? And there are all sorts of conflicting reports about that. What about if your dental practice doesn't have a car park and you've got to take a, a bus or a train and then you've got to walk quarter of a mile through a busy town centre to get to you? How are you going to manage that? And I think we shouldn't underestimate how confused patients are about what they're going to see when they get back into their dental practice. And I was actually contacted by a former patient of mine. I haven't seen patients for a number of years now, but I keep in touch with some of them. And I was contacted and asked, how on earth are you going to do dentistry through a COVID mask? Fraser, you wanted to come in. Well, I mean, I'm very interesting on that point about the news. They did ask advice people in lockdown countries. And the most sensible bit of advice I heard is to a lady that had been in for a month in Italy. She said, whatever you do, don't listen to the news too much because it is so negatively based. But what I wanted to really come in is dentists forget how gentle nonverbal communication is. And when you're in a full PPE outfit, you've lost that possibility. And people that require communica communication by lip reading, children, they are gonna be petrified when they see us dressed up in the full PPE. So we also have to take that into account. And it may need some additional work to try and, if you like, desensitize the patients to know what they're gonna see. Uh, but I, I, I suspect with children, that's going to be very difficult to try and overcome just seeing somebody in full PPE kit coming towards you. And then if they've got a second person, a nurse, I dread to think how they're going to stay in the surgery. But I just think we need to take that into account as well. So I was going to say, I think very interestingly there, Fraser, your own specialty of orthodontics have created a video, I think, actually, to try and give orthodontic patients an idea of what might actually be what's going to face them. But of course, even that can be quite scary. There are a number of YouTube videos from around the world, particular parts of the world, where, where the experience of going to the dentist is, is, is actually quite scary as a dentist to even watch. Jimmy, you wanted to come back. No, I was just going to echo Fraser's point that a reassuring smile is is worth an awful lot and, and that's one thing that we, we may potentially lose but the other thing of course depending on which draft guidelines we finally get get adopted we we are likely to see far less chaperoning in terms of other family members so if if we simon who's four years old is in for his checkup and six months ago mum would have he would have appeared with the, the buggy and three other kids to give him moral support I really can't see us returning to that model. It's almost going to be more like if you went to get your tonsils out, you go in on your own and, and, and it's a daunting prospect. And, and I think we, we, we maybe have to be cognizant of these things as well. Janine, I think you had something to add there. Yeah, and, and while we're talking about all of these feelings that the patients are going to have, the dental staff are soaking those up. Um, so, so you're getting all of that negativity, all of that worry and concern. And because dental professionals are compassionate, caring individuals, they soak that up. Um, and so they go home and they also, I mean, they literally probably feel like a wet rag having had all of the PPE on. But mentally, they feel a bit like a wet rag because they've soaked up all of that and taken it home. So one of the things I think we talked about being careful of is, is balancing that with your home life, keeping up a decent healthy diet, keeping up some decent exercise, um, seeing as many of your friends as you can, even if that's got to be remote, you know, networking, keeping, keeping yourself feeling as positive and resilient as you possibly can, so that you can reduce and get rid of some of that negative feeling that's coming in. And, and I know that we talked earlier about those people who have extrovert preferences and those people who have introvert preferences, well, actually, the majority of dentists have introvert preferences, which means they get their energy from inside themselves. So they've spent a whole day giving, giving, giving to these patients. They get home and they really just need to be alone for a while, maybe go for a walk, read a book. What they don't need is then what many of them have is the family crowding around. Kiddies need things doing. Um, and so for them, it's really hard to to build your batteries back up again and be feeling that you can go in the next day and meet all of that again 
you know, e even with the downtime that we're being told that you're going to have to have between patients, you know, which can be anything up to an hour, um, you're still going to be in the surgery. You're still going to be working. That's an interesting point because I was noting in some of the medical literature they were talking about being really keen on trying to identify a relaxation space within the work environment that you can actually get away from it. But of course, the big thing there is to ensure there is the appropriate social distancing because we know there have been instances where you're so relieved to get out of your PPE that you just forget that you can't get close to it, X or Y and, and there's been you know some transmission in those settings. So the idea that if you have got a relaxation centre, you do need to have hand sanitizer. You need to do all the appropriate social distancing. So I think a really good point about you make about downtime, but it's actually also having some downtime at work and a safe space you can go to just to just get away from it for a little bit. Oh, but you wanted to come in. Yeah, I think also one thing to consider is that for most dentists, dentistry is a business as well, that they will have somehow got to generate income, which is greater than expenditure. And in the new world after COVID, in the world that we're going back into the new normal, it is going to be very, very challenging for a start. No matter what you do, what you require, will you have the throughput of the patient? Will you have the income? Will you have the outgoing? How are you going to manage this? How are you going to manage that? So many guidelines that you see, which one is the correct one? You don't even know. Are you going to be able to uh, test all the masks within a certain time? Otherwise, your practice won't even be starting, for instance. A lot of these will cause a lot of stress. Anything they can use can be used to de-stress, like what Janine suggested that will be very, very useful, very helpful from all corners because we're facing problems left, right and centre to this extent. Very good. Lucy, I'm minded that we've had a really, I think, a, quite a broad ranging discussion. I just wonder if there are any questions from any of the people on the line, as it were, this evening. Are they totally absolutely. So, qu absolutely. Questions are coming in um, throughout uh, the, the discussion this evening. So, um, you know, just to pick up um, right back at the beginning um, that we, we were talking about, um, as just a statement, really, depressed people withdraw. So the kind of um, the information that was coming through in the discussion at the beginning is we don't know where these people are and how they're feeling because the natural instinct of depressed people is to withdraw. Um, with from kind of um, their lives a little bit. Um, so if I go through the, the next couple um, and I'm, some of these are kind of within the, the, the realms of the theme for this evening. So what's the oral manifestation for a patient COVID-19 affected? Oh, there you go. Very difficult. I think it hugely varies. There's not a standard oral manifestation. It's a combination that makes a diagnosis. A more definitive ones is um, whether you have the antigens around, which have got a limited sensitivity and specificity again, which is the problem. Um, there are lots of COVID symptoms that uh, is common. There are a lot of COVID symptoms like eyesight or others that is more or less common, uh, maybe, um, but um, it, it's not a definitive test. Oral manifestation, you can't tell, presumably. So the one that's been added to the uh, the one that's been added to the fever and the persistent cough, of course, is a change in taste or smell perception, which has been added now. So I think that's something patients might report. You need to be aware, though. I'm aware of a number of patients who've had absolutely no symptoms, no manifestations, and who have undoubtedly had COVID-19 because they've subsequently been found to have antibodies. So. Um, you, you you know you can't pick it up just by you have got to do the questions and then you would need the tests what else has been asked lucy yeah so a couple of people have raised um the 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 conversation around mouthwash um that um you picked up just before and whether the panel has any thoughts um on the evidence that's been presented so the Is evidence it so chalakum is that right? Yeah, Professor Chalicum. So um, there's a number of things around that. So the evidence coming out from PHE at the present time says that there is not significant proof of it making a significant difference to the transmissibility of COVID-19. We wait to see if there's more evidence coming out. You, you talked to Professor Chalicum, who, but um, that was using povidone iodine. I noticed from around the world that some some countries have been using hydrogen peroxide. 
Uh, similarly, some specialist associations cover it. I think we need to be guided by the science and by really good evidence base. And I think that's going to develop as we go forward rather than really being definitive at the moment. I don't know what others on the panel think. I read that uh, cytopyridinium chlorides um, is, is it muted as one, which may be effective, but obviously evidence is very thin. But I think the main thing is that if you have a patient who may be COVID-19 positive, um, the main reservoir of the virus is within the lungs, alveolus. So it doesn't really matter what mouthwash you use, it's going to come up in droplets in, in aerosol uh, if they cough. So, I, I mean, that's the limitations maybe, I suppose. I think the key thing is watch watch the evidence as you go forward and see what comes out from the rec from the experts because all of this will go up to so called in England to the public health England it will go to nerve tack it'll be looked at and they will make a pronouncement based on how strong is the evidence you see okay um so this was picked up by the the panel but it's um they're, they're kind of asking what the answer is so in in general we don't look at the team in its entire entirety um, we could do better. What's the answer? So just say that again, Lucy. I didn't quite hear so, that. So you were talking about it's the wider team working together in this situation. How do we make that happen? That's probably a good one for Janine, I think. Well, I guess as you say, relatively simple. There's relatively simple things that, that are happening with teams now in that they, they get together regularly. They have team discussions on a daily basis about what's coming into the practice, who's doing what. And I think part of that, bringing the team together, is the, the team talking about the, the probability that people are going to be feeling quite anxious, quite emotional. This is going to be a very difficult time. Uh, as Albert said, it's a difficult business time, as well as a difficult time with patients and providing treatment. So. The team needs to watch out for each other and the team needs to be given permission if one member of the team and if that's the trainee dental nurse, then let it be. If that trainee dental nurse picks up something that she's seen that's, you know, the practice owner seems to be struggling with, then we should be we should be talking out. This is about human factors and it's exactly the same as if there is an incident you know, the team should be able to pick up something that's not quite right and have the confidence to tell each other about it. Not pointing fingers, but to actually talk, there's something going on here. Um, so I think it's it's about developing that confidence within the team that everybody's watching out for everybody else and to speak up. So I think there was something I was reading as well about actually having team debriefs at the end of the day or whatever as well to say what's been going well, what come across that works really well so it's not it's not just watching out to see that your colleagues overstressed it's actually saying you know what I found something that works really well or just makes my mask more comfortable or you know I find if I do more than an hour it's really uncomfortable but if I limit it and so on and so forth I think it's that shared learning and 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 it is not one person who has all the answers it will be as you said the extended healthcare team Fraser you were looking to come in yeah, well, I did. Uh, I noticed that in our hospital team, we started with one or two clinics where they do a pre huddle and the post huddle. And everybody is part of that team the reception staff, almost the cleaners, everybody. And I think what people are going to have to adjust to is when they do return, it's not going to be the same, dare I say, manic approach to putting through the work. They will have the time for this sort of interaction. And I think this is an important stage when they all go back to allay fears, to get people working together and to make sure that the team, which is the big thing in it, will work effectively and efficiently. And I think this is quite an opportunity to be quite positive and build the practice team up at this stage. Now, I'm thinking, Jimmy, you were keen to come in there, I think. No, I was just going to mention that I, I think we are probably, we're, we're not completely there yet, but I think in terms of clinical teams, we, we do have very much more of a culture where anyone can say anything anytime. And I, I hate to steal the model from aviation yet again, but that's where we're getting all these ideas from. Um, and I, I think we have gone a long, long way away from the, you know, the James Robertson justice wandering up and down the wall shouting at everybody. You know, we, we, we've got past that. And I think that in most clinical environments now, perhaps not in front of a patient, 
but as soon as there was a gap, most people would feel comfortable just to say, you don't seem yourself today, are you okay? Yeah. That's all it takes. Really important. And empowering your team, empowering that culture of, of, of ownership across the whole group. Um, perhaps we'll move on. Lucy, another, another question, perhaps. Yeah, sure. So um, I, um, ask, I, I might struggle with this question a little, um, and it might be not be one that people can answer. I have a 64-year-old lady with obstructive jaundice, and she is toxic and needs an urgent ERCP. She is COVID-19 positive. My question is, should I disinfect the ERCP after completion? Ooh. You're going to have to translate that one for me. Well, <laughs> it's an interesting one. He says she's toxic. I mean, I think the thing the thing that people would say is if someone is COVID positive, I think the guidance is that you triage them and then you would send them into one of the urgent dental care centres for actual treatment. So they're saying ERPC, that sounds an endoscopic retrograde um, pancreatico cholecystogram, which seems slightly off the tech of the, the, the path of dentistry. So um, okay, not quite sure, Lucy. Okay. Um, so um, another um, kind of, it's more of a, a, a statement, I suppose. So when you were talking before um, around children coming in to um, have treatment um, and the, the importance of eye contacts, surely the anxiety of the full PPE, that's when virtual consultations should come into place. So people can see people's, and um, the importance of people seeing them, their eyes before so. Yeah, I mean, as it's as has been recommended in all four devolved nations, the first, the start of the consultation is is a remote consultation, and I think that that's something that people have got much much better at. I can't, I couldn't have countenanced doing the number of teleconferences or video conferences, I should say, that we've been doing on a whole range of platforms. I think people have become much more comfortable with remote discussions and remote interaction, and actually much more sensitised to picking up on body language across a, a, a small screen than they ever were before. I don't know if you, Janine, is that your impression? Yeah, I think so. I think teledentistry is really something that we need to do an awful lot more of. Um, and I think our patients are going to feel a lot more comfortable with. Uh, and I think actually we feel more comfortable with, as, as you rightly say, Michael. So, um, yeah, and that is one way that you can see, they can see your face, they can see your your eyes. You can see them. You can see the the body language that goes with it. Um, so it is one way of uncovering the mask from the point of view of, of body language and the friendly face of the dental professionals. Yeah, and I think that the move to videos that give people an idea of what they're going to come across, including children. And I know there's a number of videos within the pediatric dentistry world as well, which are, will be helpful in this arena. Lucy, another question. Yeah, sure. So um, another statement, and I'm sure that the, the panel will have kind of views, um, is one of the factors, the fact that clinical dentistry is a stressful environment. We've adapted to working within this environment. We're currently not working with this environment, which has afforded some time for reflection, and therefore the stresses are different. It takes time to realise the changes, and equally friends working in other areas are now experiencing similar stresses. Corona wobbles are prevalent across the whole of society. And I think that's a really good, a really good point. I don't think there's any sector of society that's not been impacted. Uh, you know, whatever. If my daughter's in her early 20s, she's done all her exams remotely, and I know from King's as well, the students are really scared about how does this impact on me getting my exams done? How does it impact on my internships? How does it impact on me going back to work? The staff who've been furloughed in dental or anywhere else, worrying about what that is the, what is the implication of that? They think for being furloughed. I think the whole of society has been impacted by this. Um, you know, elderly people who are really questioning whether they want to go out even though they now can and so on. So, yeah, I, I think it's a game changer, as they say, uh, and one we're only just starting to come to terms with. I think almost having been in, in lockdown and having had furloughing and everything else has been a great reassurance to many people. And it's actually going to be as we start to unwrap and unwind these processes could also be could almost be more challenging because if you could in time you can, can you can actually control the environment you live in in terms of within your house so we'll see how it plays Lucy okay anxiety and depression are the two biggest mental health issues globally amongst healthcare professions 
questions. Suicides are high. How does the panel feel we can address and potentially spot these individuals who are colleagues at risk of potential self-harm and suicide? I think Janine, you might like to start off on this and then perhaps Jimmy come in. Uh, it, the, the, whoever raised that question is absolutely right. Uh, and certainly within dentistry, we do see relatively high rates of suicide in an ordinary situation way before COVID. Um, dental professionals were fairly high up on the list of those professionals committing suicide. Um, the very, very sad fact is for some people, you can't see the signs. That is a really sad fact to have to say, but there are some people that you just don't pick the signs up on. Um, so, but that said, a, a lot of this is about communication and talking with colleagues and having that ability to say, it's okay not to be okay, which I think is, is uh, uh, Prince William's um, thing, isn't it? That he's been talking about men's mental <laughs> health. Um, and yeah. we, we do tend to see that they're right about the anxiety. I was just thinking about the figures from the Dentist Health Support Trust and the levels of mood disorder, um, anxiety and depression are quite high. And we are tending to see more women now than we used to, although it's still higher in males and we're seeing younger people than we used to as well. So I think we, we need to move away from the traditional older male as being the one that we need to watch out for. Um, and actually some of our younger colleagues and some of our female colleagues are, are the ones that we need to just watch as well. Um, I, think, I think it is what we've talked about, you know, knowing the team, talking with each other, being there for people, having the ability just to offload um, about the day I and mean, people said you know what went well today or well, didn't let's talk about it and offload about it um, and then knowing where to signpost people that you are worried about and there are a number of places there's Samaritans there's Confidential um, the, the faculty has got um, facilities for people to talk to there are mentors I mean, my own particular group have set up pro bono mentoring. We've got about 35 people who will, you know, are trained to talk to people about um, issues. So there are places that you can signpost your colleagues to, um, but it's it's actually quite a delicate area, uh, and it's it's an area that most of us could easily miss. Yeah. I'm just going to expand on that slightly for asking Jimmy's comment. I think one of the other things to bear in mind, there are a whole range of organisations, be it the Royal College, be it faculties, be it the BDA, the BMA, they've all got facilities online, so Mind UK um, and the WHO mental health uh, consideration during 2019 is there. One thing not to forget is domestic abuse. And certainly we've seen quite a significant increase in domestic abuse. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't pick up on that as being something that practitioners might actually be usefully engaged in looking out for as well within their patients. Not, I'm not saying necessarily in their team, but certainly just being aware of there's been a significant increase in, in uh, uh, domestic abuse over this period. So, Jimmy, I don't know if you had comments around this. Yeah, I mean, I think Janine almost said it. Said all. There's not an awful lot to add to, to what Janine said there. Um, I suppose the only point I would make is, in, in terms of recognising the signs in others, sometimes if if you don't know what the signs are, well, how can you recognise them? So, for for example, if someone um, is losing weight or gaining weight, or someone comes into work in the morning and says, "I haven't sleeping particularly well." Do you recognise that as a, a potential sign of stress or anxiety? You might not. You might you might put it down to something else. And in in terms of how you introduce these things to the team, most places now, most clinical environments hold regular team meetings. And to make the theme of one of those team meetings, we're all going to sit down together and look at the the signs of stress, look at the symptoms of stress and anxiety, and then it might just chime with someone in the room who never suspected themselves of suffering from stress. Wait a wee minute, that's me. Fraser. You're on mute, I think, Fraser. No, no, he's coming. Sorry. The other issue is that obviously we're talking about the team, 
But the patients are all going to come in and behind each one is going to be a story around COVID. And we may easily see some of those, particularly those of us that deal with long term issues like orthodontics, where their personality has changed. And we've got to try and pick up this change and try and point them in the right direction. And it's a bit like being in certain clinics in hospitals. You know, it can weigh you down and you need to know where you can get the help from. And I have to say the psychiatrists have been very helpful pointing the patients to the right level of support to try and get them through the issues. And I think we've all got to look at mental health now as slightly differently in the population that it's highly likely some of us at some point will have a wobble. And we just need a little bit of support through that time, not a lot, just to take us through that and then move us on. And I think we've got to remember the patients will be going through just as much. I mean, it says a lot when the government have actually said in terms of directorships now, they are saying you can actually close down, declare bankruptcy in any business in the next three months without any penalties. So the government are clearly expecting significant financial issues, which will impact on people that are committed to generating income. So I just think we need to be aware behind every patient will be a story. Yeah, Albert, you were wanting to just come in there. Yeah, yeah, I'm just reflecting what Fraser said in agreement there, such that there, there's a lot of unknown, like the tip of the iceberg, as far as business potential difficulties are concerned. We have not seen anything, we probably won't see anything for a while. It's going to get much, much worse in terms of a lot of the business sustainability, in terms of practices, in terms of patients' ability to afford treatments as well because of their own circumstances. I think also there's one point to make there is that in uh, the, the, the population there at the moment there, uh, look at the BAME population, look at the ethnic makeup of colleagues, patients alike there, the presentation and manifestation of stress and the outlooks are very, very different because of a lot of cultural differences in cultural presentations. So uh, very often we can miss it and say, ah, that's just stereotype. No, no, just worry about it. Whereas it may actually be the sign calling for help and distress. So we might need to open our eyes to say the different presentation of stress, different need for help and different um, concept and background in relation to these altogether. Yeah, so cultural awareness as well. Lucy, I wonder if we have another question. Yeah, so um, I'm going to pick up. There's a couple of questions coming through. Um, and I know Fraser talked about the finances of the patients, but there's a there's concerns raised um, from the viewers this evening about, you know, that focus of uh, making sure that bills are being paid um, and getting income coming in at, as kind of a slight mismatch of the, the values and priorities of kind of the well-being side of things and whether the panel has a view. Fraser, do you well, like to follow up on that? Well, it's just, it is yet another, I've found with people that really struggle with mental health issues, it's lots of little problems that keep adding to build them to a certain level. And having worries about finance is just one of those little steps to take them that final area. And it just, the minute you start to worry about support for your family, support for your partners, it just adds yet another level that is an issue. And when I've dealt with students, for example, in the past coming up to exams, one of the big ways to manage all this is to actually get them to compartmentalize their problems and deal with the simple problems first. So that's no longer part of the bigger picture and then just work your way through and seek advice for the other areas that nobody can be an expert in, you know, in everything, but you can actually point them in the right direction. And I think it's that is getting the right help to support people. And I think the other thing, Fraser, is to try and seek that help early on in the process, not waiting until you've reached the crescendo, which is a, is a classic one. And we've talked about how people quite often hide that. I think, Jimmy, you wanted to come in in an hour, but I think you wanted to as well. But Jimmy first. Yeah, no, I was just I was just going to um, I, I recently attended a course on mindfulness and we got to week six out of eight before lockdown <laughs> prevented <laughs> us from finishing the course, unfortunately. But um, one of the big lessons from that, and it just echoes what Fraser was saying, that 
one of the big issues people have is is um, catastrophizing the future. And there's a lot to be said for taking the view that as we come out of COVID-19, we don't we don't know for definite what the landscape is going to be. And, and most of us are coming out with all the worst doomsday options we, we can possibly think of. And I'm, I'm not suggesting how can I my tata here or anything daft like that, but but perhaps deal with the problems that we actually have and, and give less attention to the problems that may not come. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really, really difficult. And I think people do feel that they're not in control. And I think that's a real challenge. Jenny. Yeah, I absolutely yeah, I agree with what, with what Jimmy and um, Fraser have said, that, that actually it's a bit like eating the elephant. Um, you know, so eat, eat the little problems and do the little problems and the big problems that you actually can't sort and you can't control, that you shouldn't allow those to overwhelm your, your thinking. So it, it's thinking about what can I control, what can I sort, what can I do and do those things. Um, but we are very prone, as you say, to, to completely catastrophize and it's just going to be awful and appalling and we get overwhelmed with that and once you get overwhelmed you can't sort the small things out um so we, we should sweat the small stuff when it comes to this um, and get those done yeah i was just going to say that i agree or, or, in that in, in which case that if you have a small problem you try to minimize those and if you don't you somehow cannot manage as such it's very good the dentists there we hide things as well as things so that things get out of hand by the time you come to the cliff by the time you fall off the cliff there it's too late at that stage don't to wind back and to say that well you shouldn't have got there in the first place if small problem can be tackled bit by bit nothing is ideal but at least you can tackle some of the problem I'm minded we're getting towards the end of our time. So, Lucia, there, there's a couple yeah, there's maybe... two more. There's two yeah. more I'd quite like to do, if that's OK. And um, we haven't managed to get to everything, but I think these are quite um, good questions to finish on. So um, do you envisage there'll be a number of people leaving as we look to return to work? And then the second question, if I may, is what can be done to support younger dentists who are graduating in, diff in a difficult profession? with Lots of fears about doing something wrong. Do, you, do we need to support them more? So I'll do the first one, which was about people leaving. We did a member survey, and I think a number of organisations have done member surveys. And so there were quite a lot of dentists who, particularly if they were already been thinking about retiring, are saying, well, maybe now's the time to retire. There's other people who are saying, well, maybe I just want to move to a different career. So, yes, I think there will be a group who do, and, and, and it will be impossible to determine how many will actually follow through on it. But I think we will see some attrition. Um, not only within dentists, but other parts of that healthcare team as well, um, be it a receptionist, be it a dental nurse, be it a hygienist, I think we will see some of those redirect their careers, be it Eve, or choose to retire early from the profession. Um, I wonder, Jimmy, if you wanted to talk about that, what would we say to the young dentists? Because we, you know, you've been obviously intimately involved in that over the years. Yeah, um, I, I, one of the, the initiatives that have come from the GDC is that I, I believe all training programs, certainly ours, uh, are looking to introduce clinical skills sessions before newly qualified dentists are exposed to patients. And that's just in, in relation to the, the gap that they've had. But I think it would be fair to say that, that all training providers are very aware of, first of all, the clinical experience gap that, that people have had and then the ongoing clinical experience gap until we can generate aerosols. And if it, if it was any reassurance to newly qualifying dentists, um, per, perhaps I could say that those who are providing training for newly qualified dentists are extremely aware of, of number one, the gaps that have been involved, and number two, perhaps some of the, the clinical shortcomings, just as Albert said, depends how far you got along your clinical experience before the door got shut, but there may be some who were missing essential skills when that when that lockdown came, and the training providers are extremely aware of that, um, and, and they are putting lots of things in place for early support and lots of it when people join their practices. And I think the other thing is a bit about we were saying, don't be afraid to be, you know, it's fine to be not OK. I think it's fine to actually say, you know, I've not done a lot of these and I'd just like a bit more help or I'd like some supervision or whatever else. Do not 
do not suffer in silence, do not try and reach beyond. It isn't a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength to actually say, actually, I need to do a bit more. Um, Jimmy, you wanted to come back and then Fraser, I was noticing. Yeah, just, just in relation to that, one of the, the initiatives that we are um, pursuing for our own cohort of current trainees who are about to leave is that we will be expecting them to work with their educational supervisor to create a, a dedicated PDP for wherever they go. Uh, so that they can go to the next employer, to the next training provider, to, to wherever they, they land up next with clearly identified development outcomes. And that, that to me, it's not, it's not so much about it's okay not to be okay. That's just recognising that we are none of us complete professionals. We all have something to learn. And I think that's a positive that's come out of it, is that acceptance that we need to have that onward intelligence to inform training. Fraser, you've been waiting patiently. No, no, it was just to support Jimmy. You know, the, your trainers will develop more skills in this crisis. Uh, the important thing is to realise they are approachable, they will be confidential, but they will need time to actually discuss as a one-to-one -one basis how to work through problems that are unique to you. And I think they should all be encouraged to start to use this. So I'm going to give a final word to Janine and then to Jimmy, I think, probably, unless Lee, Lee's got another question. So Janine. It's a very a small thing when we're talking about trainees. Um, they can access professional support units. Um, certainly within um, England, uh, do tell me about the other areas, but I work for the one in Oxford. And dental trainees, along with medical trainees, can access up to six hours of, of coaching completely free through those PSUs. Um, and I would suggest if people are feeling they need that emotional support, then go for that coaching. It's there. You can have it. It should be yours. Perfect. And Jimmy, you wanted to come in, I think. Yeah, just a, a, a final comment maybe to anyone who's about to join a training programme, particularly the one based in general dental practice. Um, and I hope it will be some reassurance. The patients that you will be treating are the direct responsibility of your trainer. And they have every vested interest in helping you to become the best dentist that you possibly can be, if that reassures. Yeah, that's good. Lucy, any final ones? Or are we, we, any more um, there's plenty more questions to ask, but I'm conscious of time. Um, people have asked about CPD for the webinars. We're definitely looking at CPD. Um, people have mentioned you've talked about the leaving and people are thinking about um, leaving. People have asked to kind of make sure it's important that um, it's not just um, it's not just the dentist and it's all the other people in the different roles that um, we need to be supporting. So lots of stuff that's come through stuff um lots of stuff that um we haven't covered tonight on um the aerosol generated procedures and things like that but i think that's probably for another time yeah i think that's for another time so i think i think if, if, it's been great thank you very much to all our contributors and most not least not last but not least in a way thank you very very much to all the people who joined us on the webinar i hope it's been of some use to you we and all of our collective groups are here to help you as are a whole mass of other people out there and i think what, what's been really helpful tonight is here just how broad based that support that's available is so i think if in doubt reach out would be my word i mean uh, and thank you very much and we hope to see you again there is another webinar in two weeks time which i think is on the 16th of june so watch this space and you can watch some more faces and in the meantime please be well uh, and please be safe and happy all right take care thank you bye, bye. thank you